In this video, we're going to look at the structure of the atom and then carry that into a discussion on some isotope related things. First thing we want to do when we think about the parts of an atom is actually go through and do a real quick comparing and contrasting of the different parts we have in an atom. So I chose to do this in table form. So we have three main particles that go into making up an atom. The protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. And we're going to discuss these three different subatomic particles with respect to relative mass, relative charge, and then finally the location. Where would we find these at? Now, first thing I kind of want to point out is we're not going to talk about the actual mass of these or the actual charge of these. Instead, we're talking about relative mass. And what relative mass does is relative mass allows us to compare and contrast these very easily without having to worry about the super crazy small numbers that are associated with these tiny bits of matter. The numbers are so small when you talk about the mass of a proton or a neutron or an electron, it almost doesn't have any meaning. So we, instead of talking about the actual mass in grams or any other unit, we kind of have a new unit that we want to introduce for this. So we say a proton has a relative mass of 1 AMU. And that AMU stands for atomic mass unit. It's just a way for us to get down to that small scale of matter without having to use crazy small numbers that are really tough to kind of get a feel for. So a neutron weighs just slightly, slightly, slightly more than a proton, but I'm still going to list this relative mass as 1 AMU. An electron, I listed the mass as 0 AMUs, and electrons do have a mass, so that zero is kind of in quotations because it's not true. It's just so much smaller than a proton or a neutron that the mass of the electron doesn't contribute anything to the mass of the overall atom. The actual mass of the electron is about one thousandth the mass of a proton. And that's just so small, you don't have to worry about that mass compared to the other ones. It's too small to worry about. It's kind of insignificant. It doesn't contribute anything. To kind of put this in a non-chemistry example, it'd be, imagine you step on a scale, and all of a sudden a butterfly comes and lands on your shoulder. Is that butterfly going to change the weight you see on the scale? Well, probably not. It's very, very small. But does that butterfly have its own independent mass that we could measure? Sure it does. It's just that when we combined your mass and the butterfly's mass, it's pretty much just your mass. And that's what we're seeing for the protons and neutrons compared to the electrons. The electron just doesn't have enough weight to really worry about its mass compared to the other things. Same thing we did with mass we're going to do with charge we're going to talk about relative charge so we don't have to deal with crazy small numbers so the relative charge of a proton we say is positive one neutrons are electrically neutral no quotes needed there electrons have the same magnitude or size charge that a proton does but it's the opposite sign we also want to talk about the location of each of these Protons and neutrons are located in what's called the nucleus. Meanwhile, the electrons are located outside of the nucleus. So we're going to talk about some models of the atom coming up next. So this chart is all well and good. You can compare and contrast these different subatomic particles using this chart. But what this chart doesn't do a good job on is really giving you a good visual for what does an atom really look like? How do these properties kind of play out when we're actually thinking about an atom? So that's what we want to look at next. So what does an atom look like? Kind of on the left, what I drew was the classic 
model of the atom. You got a circular shaped atom with a small nucleus in the middle. Kind of very similar to a human type cell even. There's a problem with this model. The problem with this model is that this model gets the proportions very, very wrong. This type of model greatly over exaggerates the volume of the nucleus compared to the rest of the atom. Even if I were to make the nucleus the tiniest of dots, that would still greatly over exaggerate the actual volume that we see in that nucleus. So if this model doesn't work because the proportions are completely wrong, how can we really get a good visual of what an atom looks like? You know, even if, even if the smallest dot makes the nucleus too big, how can we really get an appreciation for what does this atom look like? So I want to try to do this with hopefully some things you're a little bit familiar with. I want us to think about a different way of visualizing the atom with some things you're hopefully a little bit more familiar with. So on the left, I have a professional sports stadium, kind of an overhead shot of that. I chose baseball. You could do this with soccer, football. It pretty much all works the same. A large sports stadium. So envision that. That entire large sports stadium is the entire atom. Now, on the right, another object you're familiar with is imagine one single small P. I want you to imagine taking one of those small single P's and walking out into the middle of that sports stadium and dropping that P right into the middle of that stadium. Now you have a visual of that P sitting right in the middle of that sports stadium. That P represents the nucleus. The rest of the stadium represents the rest of the atom. That gets you much closer to the actual proportions in there. The nucleus is so incredibly tiny compared to the rest of the atom. Just like the P is so incredibly tiny compared to the rest of the sports stadium. The nucleus only represents a small, small, small size volume of that actual atom. Just like the P is only a small, small, small part compared to the entire sports stadium. So when you're thinking about an atom, I think this is a clever visual to kind of get you thinking and getting things in about the right proportions of how tiny the nucleus is compared to the rest of that atom. You have two very, very different worlds inside versus outside the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, protons and neutrons, you have an incredibly large mass in there. That's where all the mass is, but a very, very small volume. We think about what density is, mass divided by volume. If we have a very large mass but a very small volume, that is going to be extremely dense. Not only will it be extremely dense, it's almost unimaginably dense. If you would look at the density of a nucleus, it would be about a million times more dense than ordinary matter that you manipulate. So something like a gold ring. Imagine that gold ring weighing a million times more than it did. That would give you an idea of that actual density. Inside the nucleus, besides also being very dense, you also have an extremely concentrated positive charge. You have a lot of positive charge jammed into that same small area. So a very concentrated positive charge. Outside the nucleus, very, very different world. Just the electrons. That's going to be a very, very small mass, but a large volume. That is not going to be dense at all. Not only does it, is it not dense in terms of mass and volume, it's a very diffuse or spread out of negative charge. The negative charge, you have a lot of it outside the nucleus. All the electrons are negatively charged, but 
there's a lot of room. So they're able to spread out. That means a very spread out or diffuse negative charge. You want to think about it as almost like wispy, cloud-like. Everything is very, very spread out. So you get these two very different and opposing worlds inside the nucleus with this crazy amount of mass, but in that very small volume with that extreme density and all of that positive charge jammed up into that same little spot. And outside the nucleus, not a whole lot. Small mass spread out over a large volume, negative charge spread out over that very, very large volume as well. So I want to talk a little bit about isotopes. And there's a format that we use for describing isotopes. And this is kind of the format in the big box is the elemental symbol. That is where you would actually place the element that you're dealing with. If you're dealing with carbon, you have a C there. If you're dealing with nitrogen, you'd have an N there. In the upper left of that is where you'd place the mass number. And what the mass number is, is the, it's the mass of the isotope. When you think about what contributes to the mass of an atom, we recognize it's the protons and the neutrons. So the mass number will be the same as the number of protons and neutrons. In the lower left-hand corner is what's called the atomic number. So the atomic number gives you the identity of the element. It's almost like the element's social security number. And the identity of the element is based upon how many protons that atom or that isotope actually has. Different protons are what's going to give us the different elements. There's one more thing you sometimes see in this isotopic format, and that's in the upper right-hand corner. Sometimes you see the charge. What the charge is, is, it is the charge of that isotope. And if we look at the two things that have charge, the two subatomic particles that have charge are the protons and the electrons. So the charge is the protons minus the electrons. And this is kind of important. We're going to see a lot of things this semester have charges in it because the electrons are always changing. Electrons are almost like the currency of chemistry. They're getting moved. They're, you're gaining electrons. You're losing electrons. Meanwhile, the protons are almost always staying the same. So what this charge does, it gives us a little bit of accounting in terms of what's our relationship between number of protons and the number of electrons. We kind of go and look at the periodic table. The periodic table is not set up in isotopic format. Okay. Here, the atomic numbers are in the upper left that increase left to right. So the atomic number for carbon is 6, nitrogen 7, 8, 9, 10. Because this is an isotopic format. We'll talk a little bit about that later in this video. And what you see in, for the mass numbers is you see average mass numbers below the element. Now remember... What you see on any periodic table is not listed in the format that we generally write isotopes in. So I want to do one real quick isotope problem. We'll put a couple more in a different video. But I'll make sure we kind of get through at least one because it makes sense for some of the other things we want to do with isotopes is... I put up an isotope in its standard notation, 31 in the upper left, 15 in the bottom left, negative 3 in the upper right. You have a symbol there. So using that, we want to complete this information. So first thing, I already have the answers in here, but how did we get where we got? How did we figure out the number of protons? Well, the protons we saw from the previous slides or the same as the atomic number. Well, where's the atomic number at? Well, the atomic number is 15. Well, that means our atomic number is 15. That's also going to mean atomic number and the number of protons match. That's going to give us 15 protons. Your number of protons 
and your atomic number always are going to be the same. Those are going to completely always match. Those have to match. There's no choice but for them to match. Okay, that's literally the definition of what they are. Well, what else can we figure out here? Well, we can also identify the mass number real quickly. That's in that upper left-hand corner, that 31. Well, that 31 that we see here, well, that's the mass number. So that's where we got that from. And that's just matching the location for what it's trying to tell you. We can also do the same thing for the charge. Negative 3, well, that's the upper right-hand corner. That tells us what the charge is. Sometimes you'll see the charge written as 3 minus. Sometimes you'll see it as minus 3. It means the same thing. It's kind of like first name, last name versus last name, first name on a form. It's telling you the exact same thing. So we figure out the protons, the mass number, the atomic number, the charge. What we still have to figure out are the neutrons and the electrons. Let's start with the neutrons. And here's how we're going to figure that out. There's a relationship between protons, neutrons, and the mass number. The relationship between protons, neutrons, and the mass number. So how do we get the 16 in here? Well, what has to be true for protons, neutrons, and mass number is the mass has to come from the combination of the protons and the neutrons. So the protons and the neutrons combined have to give you that mass number. So I had 31 as the mass number. 15 of it came from the protons. Where did the rest of the mass have to come from? Well, it had to come from the number of neutrons. That was the only choice in that. So the last thing we kind of have to figure out are the number of electrons that we have. And there's a couple different ways we can do that. One is kind of more algebraically. We can say that charge equals protons minus electrons. The charge is negative 3. The protons are 15. We're looking for the electrons. That would be x. So, I mean, we could do this kind of algebraically, we could say, okay, well, figure out these, to figure out these electrons, what we could do is we could say, okay, we use a little algebra. We say, okay, negative three, that's going to equal the number of protons, which we already have, which is 15, minus the number of electrons, x for our number of electrons. We could solve this. We could get 18 electrons coming out. So we could do it that way, and that'd be fine. Kind of an algebraic way of thinking about it. There's also a little bit more of a chemical way of thinking about this as well. And this is where you could kind of just say, okay, I know protons are positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. I have more. What do I have more of? Well, if my charge is negative 3, I better have more of the negatives. So that means I need more electrons than protons. How many more? Three more. So either one of those techniques you could really use to get at the 18 electrons that you're looking at for this. We will do a couple more isotope problems in a separate video. So please be sure to watch that separate video where we're going to do some more isotope problems. So we've done a lot with isotopes already, but what we haven't actually done yet is explain what exactly is an isotope. So an isotope is a form of the same element with a different mass. Well, if it's the same element, it will have the same number of protons. That's what gives each element its identity. So if it's the same element with a different mass, that different mass has to come from a differing number of neutrons. So that's kind of what we're seeing here. I put up the three main isotopes of carbon, carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. Sometimes you won't see the atomic number listed. They're not trying to put one over on you or be sneaky. It's just that if you're doing chemistry, you're going to have a periodic table out. You would quickly see what carbon's atomic number is in that periodic table. Carbon's always going to have six protons. 
the neutrons. Well, it's protons plus neutrons give me that mass number. So the mass number being 12, I better have six neutrons. The mass number is 13, I better have seven neutrons. If the mass number is 14, I better have eight neutrons there. When we look at carbon on the periodic table, the 12.011 that we see represents the weighted average of all the isotopes of carbon. There are no carbon atoms in the universe that weigh 12.011. None of them. Zero. No carbon weighs 12.011. What that 12.011 represents is the weighted average based upon the abundance of how often you see each specific isotope. So without going through the actual calculations, I picked one where we can kind of see this easy. The carbon-12, it has a relative abundance of about 99%. Almost all the carbon we're looking at is carbon-12. Well, that's why the average is so close to 12, because most of it is 12. There's a little bit of carbon-13, about a percent. What does that do? That's going to bump up the average just slightly over 12. We have even a smaller amount of carbon-14. That's going to bump up the average. So that's what you're looking at. When you're looking at the elements on the periodic table, what you're seeing is not the mass of a specific isotope, but instead what you're looking at is the weighted average of all of the isotopes with respect to their relative abundance. Now it's kind of important. There's a directionality to this. The relative abundance information can tell you the weighted average, but it doesn't work backwards. Just knowing the weighted average does not allow you to accurately predict what the specific isotopes are or what the abundances will ultimately be. And what does that mean? We'll go through another example showing this, but what that means is if I knew the information on the table on the top, the isotopes and their abundances, I could calculate the 12.01. I can go in that direction. I cannot go in the other direction. If I just knew the 12.011, I couldn't predict or figure out or calculate what's going on in that table. And what we want to do next is we want to do an example that kind of shows you that directionality. So the element I want us to look at for this is bromine. So bromine has an average mass number of 79.90. What's 79.90? What's that really, really close to? That is really, really close to 80. Being it's so close to empty, wouldn't it be kind of tempting to expect that one of the isotopes of bromine would have a mass of 80? I think it'd be very tempting to do that. Not only would that isotope exist but being it's so close to 80 it's almost wanting us to say that it would also have a relatively high abundance maybe 90 95 percent that's where the mistake comes in this is a flawed way of looking at it you can't work in that direction because if you try working in that direction, it just doesn't hold up. You can't go in that direction. Here's why. Here's why I picked out that example. We kind of on the left were tempted to say one of the isotopes of bromine was 80 and that it was high abundance. Well, on the right, we see what actually happens. In actuality, there isn't a bromine 80 isotope. It doesn't exist. The actual main isotopes of bromine are bromine 79 at 50.7% and bromine 81 at 49.3%. This makes the average really, really close to 80, but an actual bromine 80 isotope doesn't exist. So the average ends up being really, really close to 80, but you never actually get 80. I want to put this directionality way of dealing with the averages and the abundance of the isotopes in kind of a non-chemical way that I think you're going to be a little bit more familiar with. This works the same way as your course grades, your course averages in all of your courses. 
I want you to think about if your final average in a course was 93%, does that mean you necessarily ever had exactly 93 in an assignment? No, <laughs> it doesn't mean that. That's that directionality. Also, by looking at the final average, you can't say with any certainty what a specific score on any assignment was. Just because you got a 93 final average doesn't mean you scored 93 on any test, quiz, paper, report, project. This works the exact same way like isotopes and average mass numbers. If you know all the information about the isotopes, including the abundance, you can calculate that final average. But if all you know is the final average, that doesn't tell you anything about the specific isotopes. Kind of putting it back to that course grade idea, I want you to think about two people with the exact same final average, 93%. Could they have gone about that a very, very different way to achieve that final average? Absolutely. One person maybe did really well on projects, not so well on exams. Maybe somebody else did the exact opposite. Maybe somebody else did really good on quizzes and papers and not so well on the exams. They still ended up with a 93. That 93 average can't tell you anything specific about what actual assignments were that went into that. But if you know all the information on the specific assignments, you can figure out the average. It's just like the isotopes and the average mass numbers. The average mass numbers are the final grade, the final average. The isotopes and the specifics there are like those specific quizzes, exams, assignments. Remember, there's going to be a separate video on isotopes where we do a couple more examples. Please remember to make sure you are watching that.